And so as we, as we gather together with the thought of prayer, um, the, the goal is for you to unite your hearts with who's ever praying and, and you saying amen and agree, being in agreement with what is being prayed, being in agreement that that person needs prayer, that, that situation needs prayer. Now, I, and I don't want to lessen anyone's prayer request, but I do want to highlight, uh, highlight a couple, and the first one I want to highlight is this. Um, many of you know, I'm sure, you've seen on the news, about the uh, about the shooting that happened in in Waterboro, um, in North Waterboro, I was I was called to be on scene for that as a chaplain for the Maine State Police, and uh, and the deputy who was involved is a member here, Levi Johnson, and so uh, I know many of you knew that, um, but uh, you can imagine the, the difficult time that. Uh, that Levi and Chelsea and the children are, are having is that you kind of process that because it was a fatal shooting. And uh, saw Levi today, uh, spent some time down, down, at the, uh, down at the sheriff's office, uh, being part of a debrief. And uh, it, I would just really like for us to just Stop and just in your hearts, join us in prayer as we as we lift up Levi and Kelsey and their children as they as they walk through this difficult time uh, that is a, a sad necessity in the job that, that God has called them to do. So please, please join me. Father, an incident like this certainly doesn't catch you by surprise. Father, you know all of those who are involved. You know the families that are involved. Lord, we do pray for the family of the deceased. Father, we pray that you would have someone come alongside of them. Father, help them walk through the consequences, Father, of, of this individual's choice. Father, for the, for the family that was a witness to it, Father, we pray that you would wrap your arms around that. Father, give us opportunity as the door opens, Father, to minister there. Because there's certainly a need there as well. Father, of course, our hearts are drawn to Levi and Chelsea who, who worship right here with us. They're part of this family. Father, thank you for all of the love and all of the notes and all of the care that has gone out. Lord, I know it's appreciated. Father, I know that they are leaning on you like never before. Lord, we pray for your peace. To not just surround them, but to fill them. Father, we pray that you would strengthen them through it. Father, we pray for, for, for their children who are too young to fully understand it all and don't even need to try, but they know something's off. Father, I pray that you would minister your peace to their little hearts and souls as well. Father, help us as a church. Lord, to to be loving and wise in the way that we minister to them during these days. Father, give us, give us wisdom of the tongue and give us a sense of heart. Lord, knowing that because we don't do the job, we don't pull the job.
as we do it so as to not push too much. Thank you, Father, for your love, for your concern, for all that are involved. And Lord, I just want to pray specifically for Levi and Chelsea again. Lord, just wrap them in your arms of love. May they know your presence there in their house tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Are there some requests out there that you would like to have me take to the Lord in prayer or maybe one of the other men would like to do that. That would be fine too. I know there, that, that there are a number of folks who are, who are dealing with illnesses but any specific prayer that I could give I'm just looking up now and, and, uh, and uh, seeing that it's quarter of and uh, realizing we started just a little late with the prayer, so, so why don't we do this? Uh, why don't we, uh, we, we, will, we will hold on to those prayer requests. And I just want to pray for our brother Paul. It is, it is such a joy to have he and his family here with us. Um, it, is a, it, it has always been a delight to have Paul come and minister to us because of the depth of, of what he shares. And... Uh, and it's kind of special because of the fact that our, our brothers had a physical struggle for the last three months. And, uh, and is this your first speaking engagement since? Oh, okay, yes, okay. So we'll claim the first one then. <laughs> it, is, it is truly a privilege to have you here. And I would just like to pray specifically for Paul. As he, as he gets ready to minister to us this weekend and uh, pray for tomorrow for, uh, for the community to be coming in. It would be, it'd be such a delight to see absolute strangers walk onto these grounds and, uh, and get a taste of, of their creator, just a taste of understanding that they are made in the image of a holy God. So... Join, my, join with me in your hearts in prayer. Father, thank you for our brother Paul. Father, thank you for the ministry to which you've called him, to which you've gifted him. Lord, we are excited to hear your word. We're excited to hear the topic. Lord, not just to further strengthen our understanding and, and our heart on your word. But Father, that we would gain knowledge, that we would be able to share in conversation with those who do not know you, with those who believe a lie when it comes to what their origin is. Father, we pray for his eyes tonight. We pray for, for his strength. Father, we pray that you would Strengthen him in a mighty way for this evening, for this message. Thank you, Father, in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Paul, I'm going to let you introduce yourself because I will probably say too much. So you come right ahead, and I'm going to grab you a second bottle of water. No, turn that back off, Rob. Keep it off. Thank you. Am I still muted here? Am I on? You can hear me? You can hear me now. I am thrilled to be back out doing things. I had a mess. I was supposed to be at Teen Missions doing their boot camp. I was supposed to be at Youth with a Mission, and instead I was having some surgery, and I keep growing these things. They drive me nuts. So, uh, yeah, I can't grow hair worth beans, but I'm doing great with, like, other stuff. And... Uh, I had my eyes swollen shut for about a month. I was unable to read for about two months. And after the surgery, I had to see an eye deformity specialist, and I finally am able to read as of this past Monday. So, wow, I'm like five days into reading here, all right? Yeah, it's good. And for me, I'm kind of a fanatic with studying, so this was a major problem to cancel so many things 
and I'm glad to be back out doing this, so thank you for having me. Uh, we have done way over 15 or 1,600 outreaches now in the last 17 years. I can't tell you what it's like to be on the road for 17 years, but I don't know, three or 400 houses I slept in, that's an adventure. And uh, I speak at different schools and do different tours and some of the bigger youth ministries. And we do have a small creation museum in Bridgeton, Maine, which I know you're aware of. And tomorrow, I just want to give a little plug for Aliens, the Truth. Um, when Congress was debating aliens, the Awesome Science uh, Network, which is a Christian video distributors, picked our video and uh, they called me up and said we'd like to offer this as like a kind of an outreach campaign and I said yes but I want you to offer it for free so uh, that was awesome so I want to give you a little clip of what we're gonna look at tomorrow and uh in the 1950s 10 percent only 10 percent of people in general believed in real aliens and other planets today completely different for 18 to 24 year olds, 75% believe in real aliens and other planets. You turn on the TV any time of day, morning, noon, or night, you're gonna see alien shows. All the games, aliens. All the movies, aliens. We are living in an alien obsessed culture. And we need to be able to provide biblically based answers for this generation. We gotta answer questions like, are the elongated skulls that are all over the internet that they say they have DNA proof as being aliens, are they really alien skulls? What about the ancient alien series? Is the series correct? Are the proofs that they give really proof? What happened at Roswell? That's kind of the biggest alien thing. Were there alien bodies there? Was it a government cover-up? What about abductions? In Aliens the Truth, we will answer all of those questions and we will give a balanced biblical presentation on what aliens really are. We will examine God's purpose for the universe. Take a look at Aliens the Truth. So we'll be digging into that. On Sunday, we'll be doing uh, Image of God versus Image of an Animal during the Sunday morning services in the evenings, which covers most of the historical kind of things. In the evening, we'll be doing uh, what are Neanderthals really, and uh, that is a very interesting study. The guy who was able to go into all the museums, Dr. Jack Quazzo, uh, he had been trained by the guy who examined Adolf Hitler's teeth, and he was an expert in forensic teeth things. He examined every single Neanderthal skull in the world, which is not actually that many of them, and uh, he, what he found was a whole bunch of deliberate deceptions. And I'm going to show those with photographic evidence because he's the only one who x-rayed them, took up close photos of them. And when he passed away, the family took uh, a year to figure out who they wanted to give all their, his material to, and they chose me. So I'll be bringing you full color stuff of what's really going on with that topic. It's very, very important. So let's dig into dinosaurs, the truth. Anybody want to hear about dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are great. And uh, very interesting, it's used as probably the A number one hook to pull kids into evolution. It's in all the schools, but God makes it clear how he created things, uh, when he created things, the process he used to create things. And it's interesting, when God says in Genesis 1, I created the great creatures of the sea according to their kind, he actually says in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, I created according to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds, ten times. So God says I created the great creatures of the sea according to their kinds, every winged bird according to their kind, the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind. But we would look at this kind of forest of trees, not just one evolutionary tree, but a forest of trees, and we would see God creating according to their kind. We would put steel walls between each kind based on a biblical uh, understanding. And you can have adaptation in there. You can have some changes in there. But from a biblical perspective, you would not see one kind becoming another kind. Now, they used to look at the Triceratops, now called the Triceratops series. And they said this is actually six different dinosaurs. And so as they looked at those six different dinosaurs, they would add the quantity of dinosaurs up to literally 1,900. 
And what they realized was is they actually weren't looking at six dinosaurs. And it all started because the big one here, the Taurosaurus, uh, they said, why do we never find, it, find any kid Taurosauruses ever? Not a speck of a kid Taurosaurus anywhere. And what they realized was, was what they're actually looking at here is one dinosaur type getting older. Lots of changes, like when you've got kids, right, and you're a Triceratops mom, and you, you don't want the kids with the horns sticking straight out because then they stab their brother or sister in the eye with the horn. So the horns are facing up, and they move down into a combat position as they get older. Now, the Triceratops kind is one kind. It's not six different kinds of dinosaurs. It's one kind. There are only 15 kinds of dinosaurs. This is going to play in later on. Keep that in your mind. Follow it away. You can see this design all over the place with dinosaurs. Um, the head of a Triceratops, a full adult male, is the size of a car. The body is the size of a school bus, not a little wimpy school bus, like a full-size school bus. So you want a Triceratops, take a school bus, jam a car on for the front as a head, and you got it. There are phenomenal design elements all through the body, but I'll just point this one out. There are actually more bones in one toe than in a full leg of a horse. They're actually the same shape as the bones in a full leg of a horse. And the Triceratops has that many bones in a single toe. Food requirement for a Triceratops per day is about 1,000 pounds. And literally, when you see this guy coming, he is big, he is bad, and he is the size of a school bus. Now, the Word of God says he created all the wild animals according to their kind. He created the Triceratops according to their kind. But evolution says, no, no, the Bible's wrong. One kind evolves into another kind. And they're going to give you a whole bunch of examples in school. I'm going to start with a simple one for the younger people. Um, This is the one I saw. This is the one I had a question about. Now, I believed totally in evolution. And I have changed my position. And I remember this was the first thing I was taught, the, the moss. Now, the moss, if you look at the bottom, there's white moss, there's darker moss. And all the trees were nice and clean. And so the darker moths got eaten first, right? Because they could be seen easier. Then the Industrial Revolution happened, and they usually say, kids, the Industrial Revolution evolution happened, and uh, the trees got all dark from all the pollution we were making, and now you could see the white uh, moths easier, and the white moths got eaten. That's evidence of evolution. Now, I remember as a kid going, wait a minute. They start as what? A moth. They end as what? A moth. Is there any kind-to-kind change? Is there any gain or even loss of information in this at all? Nothing. There's just one color getting eaten, another color getting eaten. That's like saying, okay, we're going to just kill everybody with blue hair, and that's it. There's no evolution in this story whatsoever. You're following me so far? You have to engage your mind in what you're being told in school, and you have to look at the Word of God, and you've got to work through these things through a biblical point of view. So let's move on to the one that's pushed in colleges today. Uh, Richard Dawkins would say this is the proof of evolution. We're actually watching it happen right now, right before our eyes. When the British went down into the subways during World War II, mosquitoes went down there with them. So within the last 50 years or so, those mosquitoes have changed. In fact, they have changed so much that if you brought them back up to the surface, they're living down there, if you brought them back to the surface, they could not have children with mosquitoes from the surface. This is the, one of the biggest ones being pushed in college now. Now, you need to think through this. They start as what? A mosquito. They end as what? A mosquito. Is there any kind-to-kind change whatsoever? No. Is there any gain or loss of information? Whoa, there's big-time loss. I mean, let's just say... You, right here in this room, 
could not have babies with anybody else but only the people right in this room. If you went anywhere else, no babies. Is that a loss of information? You better believe that's a loss of information. That's like a massive loss of information. So is that actually evolution that you're seeing? No, it's a massive loss of information with humongous detrimental consequences. Evolution requires millions of information uh, increasing mutations and, and evolution really does not uh, uh, provide it. So did dinosaurs evolve into birds? And this is huge. If I went to your normal church and we put 100 kids out there and I said, to, okay, all you kids have been in church for years and years and years. How many of you think dinosaurs evolved into birds? More than half of the kids would raise their hands because they've been taught it since kindergarten, since first grade. It's the one that's being pushed right now, huge. Used to be the horse, used to be the whale. Right now, the, the dinosaur into bird is, is the one that's being pushed. Did dinosaurs really evolve into birds? Now, look what the Bible says. So God created the great creatures of the sea according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. God says he made birds as birds. One must be true, one must not be true. So let's take a look at them. This is Archiraptor, the first one that came out on the cover of National Geographic magazine, a multi-million dollar release. When it was finally allowed to be CAT scanned, it was actually discovered that, and it was CAT scanned by the University of Texas, they were all evolutionists that did the CAT scan and the counting of the bones. The discovered Archiraptor in the multi-million dollar release was actually made of 88 different pieces of stone and bone, giving new meaning to the words made in China, for real. When you do not do the CAT scan first, you make massive mistakes. Please do the CAT scan first before you do the multi-million dollar releases. Um, what's interesting is, is they were all coming off of the same factory line, and you would never see them in the ground. You would never see a picture of them ever in the ground. That's what we call in situ. In situ is extremely important. I found a series of very small footprints in the Connecticut River Valley with the dinosaur tracks that weren't allowed to be there. And so when we uncovered it, within five minutes, 20 people had taken pictures of it. That is in situ. The most important fossils are always shown in situ. You will never see a dino bird in situ, period, ever. So Confucius Ornus. Well, there couldn't be a thing wrong with Confucius Ornus. I mean, that's the big one. That's in all the textbooks, millions of textbooks. Coast to coast, what could possibly wrong, be wrong with Confucius Ornus? When they finally CAT scanned Confucius Ornus and examined it, you can actually see a thick layer of grout that was used to glue it all together, air bubbles, separation joints, little pieces of metal that came off the file that they used to file it down. And so they start, started to panic because the big one just collapsed. Um, they assembled a team by, led by Dr. Alan Fiducia. Dr. Fiducia is a diehard evolutionist. He's considered by everybody to be a bird expert. Everybody that was placed on the team were evolutionists. They were all considered to be bird experts. So that team was made up of the best evolutionary points of view you can have, who knew their birds, who knew their stuff. They examined every single dino bird and did not find a true feather in any of them. This is their quote, they found collagenous fiber meshworks that form feather-looking patterns during decomposition. Translated for us normal people means the dinosaur was dying, it was decomposing. In the skin were collagen fibers, which should obviously be there. They were fossilized as straight lines in the fossil. They desperately wanted them to be some kind of prototype developing feather, they were not. They were simply collagen fibers, and all the dino birds fell apart at the same time. Now, I was out in Blanding, Utah. I was looking for dinosaurs, and uh, I went to this museum. I was interested in going there because about 75% of the museum is dedicated to dinosaur bird evolution because the gentleman who owns it is a paleo artist. 
And so I was kind of looking forward to seeing what was actually in the museum because the whole process just fell apart. So first laid my eyes on a Dionychus. We have a six foot flushed out one at our little museum. And this is my era, John Wayne, macho Dionychus. Big, bad, tough, and he's covered with scales. Underneath him, you see a little plaque. It says, instead of using speculative imagination to justify the possibility of feathers, the original depictions of Dionychus were conservative and had a scaly hide as was seen in the mummified dinosaurs. They found dinosaurs that were mummified. They had scales. My generation got macho Dionychus, macho John Wayne Dionychus. Now, that is not the Dionychus of this current generation. Same dinosaur, different interpretation, covered with feathers now. And underneath it, you read, feathers still have not been discovered with the fossils of Dionychus. Newest representation of Dionychus by Louis Ray, famous paleoartist. He basically looks like a giant turkey, which would look great on your Thanksgiving Day table, but it would crush the table at about 3,000 pounds. And uh, that's not based on science. That is based on desperately, desperately wanting your children to believe that dinosaurs evolved into birds. Because if they can believe that first, they can move on to humans next. It's just what they do. If you're doing real science on this, they'd be covered with John Wayne macho scales. Now, Archiraptor, the first one I showed you, sold for $80,000. And it was a fake. The next one started rolling off. Well, you can see the price on this one, $25,000. I went with my wife to the fossil show in Denver. We were out there, and uh, I walked up to the table of the factory of where these things come from. And I get in trouble kind of often with this stuff. I try to behave myself. So I walk up to the table. I'm really trying to behave myself. That is my intention. I look down at the table, I see about 15 of these stretched out like that. I looked at them all individually and I just started to laugh. And the gentleman said to me, why are you laughing? I said, well, I'm just wondering, how did you get all 15 of these dino birds to pose in the same position as they died? Exactly the same, all 15. So that's why they're down to $2,000 and the warnings all over the internet that they are fake. Really, you cannot evolve a dinosaur. I mean, there's a whole lot of problems, but you start looking at the lungs, the dinosaurs breathe like us. Big billows action, in, out, up, down. Big billows action happening. Two-way breathing. Birds do not breathe like that. They breathe one way. So how do you start evolving from a two-way diaphragm breathing system into a one-way breathing system? You would have to start by necessity with a hole in the diaphragm, and then you drop dead that very second. <laughs> you don't do nothing after that. So yeah, so really the bird lung is too lofty for a challenge uh, for evolution to really get over. This particular bird beats its wings at 1,800 beats per minute, and God created every winged bird according to its kind. Now, our dinosaur is really millions of years old. Well, come on, Paul. This is science. This is cold, hard science. This is radiometric dating. Now, I've been down this road many a times. I had to do it in my own mind. I had to do it when I was digging things up. And I'll tell you what, I have dug up things that I have been mystified at. And I really wish they would do what they call blind dating, which they used to do. It's not like dating somebody you haven't met. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sending something to a lab and coming back with a date and you don't tell the lab where it came from. They won't do that anymore. They insist on actually knowing the date of the stone in which it's found in, and then they'll give you a date back. So I was working in an evolutionary, I don't believe the millions of years, I was working in an evolutionary uh, site that was called early, uh, dated at early Jurassic. I found a stick. This side of the stick was turned to coal. The middle of the stick was petrified. The far end of the stick was pretty much just a stick like you'd find outside. If you cut that in three pieces and you send it in, the, the 
Carboniferous dates would come back at 300 million years, the coal stuff. The stuff in the middle would come back because it's a dinosaur thing at 150 million years. And this side would come back if it's very young. So I know from digging that the dates don't make sense. What about radiometric dating? Well, when you watch the stone form, literally watch it form. Evolutionists say when it forms, when you watch it form, it's starting at day one. That is what they say. Dr. Stephen Austin goes to the top of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens erupted, uh, and uh, the dome was formed through three dome-forming events in the 80s, which most of you remember, many of you remember. Pretty, uh, pretty intense situation out there. And Dr. Stephen Austin went to the top of Mount St. Helens. We watched it form in the 80s. We knew the date it formed. It formed through three dome forming events. He took off two samples, broke the samples down into what they're supposed to be broken down, sent them down to the Geochron Dating Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one of the oldest and considered one of the best in the country. We watched it form in the 80s. Came back 2.8 million years old. It was only off by 2.8 million years. So, regardless, this is not a one-time thing. You go to any volcanic situation, you watch it form. This uh, particular one, the oldest it could be is 1949, came back 35 million years old. So when you watch it form, it's always wrong. When you put two things together, it's always wrong. What do you mean by that? There's all kinds of places where you have two different things together. And you could date those separately. Well, what happens when you do that? This is uh, in Crescent Mine, Cripple Creek, Colorado. There's volcanic rock. And inside the volcanic rock contained, completely sealed within the side of the volcanic rock, is wood. The wood dated at 41,000 years old. The volcanic rock dated at 32 million years old. Totally wrong. When two things are together, the dates are always wrong. When you look inside, the dates are always wrong. Now, the first guy to actually find soft tissue is Joe Taylor, the guy that actually has trained me. He's my mentor. He's a good friend. He sends me weird, unusual fossils periodically. And he found collagen fibers, fresh collagen fibers, not mummified, not mineralized, just fresh collagen fibers in T-Rex bone. He was the first one to find soft tissue. Then uh, uh, blood was actually found. Uh, by some uh, Montana State University lab people. And dinosaur blood? Wait a second. The process of biochemical decay starts immediately at the time of death. Now, somehow, dinosaur blood needs to last 65 million years. Go home, count the 65 million. We'll never see any of you ever again. One guy tried to count to a million. He quit after four months. 65 million is virtual immortality. How can dinosaur bone not decay in 65 million years? How can you have red blood cells? How can you have DNA strands in dinosaur bone? We know from experiments how, how quickly DNA degrades, and it's gone in thousands of years. How can it now become miraculously there in 65 million-year-old dinosaur bone? In this uh, particular dig site in the Colville River, Alaska, they found a huge pile of fresh dinosaurs. Not petrified, not mineralized, not mummified, not nothing. Fresh as yesterday's chicken. Really, 65 million years old. B-Rex changed the course of everything because they finally started looking inside and they started finding soft tissue galore. There's so much soft tissue out there now that has been found that you couldn't even sit here. You'd be a couple hours just showing the samples. But it truly was soft. The translucent vessels were so elastic that when you pulled them apart, they would stretch out and snap back like a rubber band. And people looked at that and said, that doesn't look 65 million years old. Uh, they turned to hadrosaurs next, which is probably the largest quantity of a single type of dinosaur of bones that we have. They found the same soft tissue, they found the same blood, they found the same uh, veins that stretched out and snapped back, and they refused to release the pictures for two years. Why? Because that does not look old at all. 
Canadian team discovered skin. And uh, it wasn't a skin impression. It was actually skin. Huge discovery of a huge set of skin recently in the last month. Uh, this is a Creation Research Society dig that my wife and I were actually supposed to be on when I found a huge tumor on my leg. And I'm, I was really sad not to be at this one. They found this triceratops horn. And inside the horn was a piece of flesh that you can actually watch it on YouTube bob up and down in the Petri dish. Now, there's always science guys on there with serious degrees. There was a guy named Dr. Mark Armitage on the dig. He's a doctorate in uh, electron microscope type things. He taught at the University of California in Northridge. He published uh, the find in a secular journal. Never mentioned God at all. Never mentioned creation at all. He just published the find of the soft tissue. When he went back to work in the fall to start teaching at the college, his boss stormed into his room and said, we will not put up with your religion at this university. You're fired. Why? Because he just published the find of a soft tissue, which everybody knows is there galore all over the place. He sued the University of California. Of course, he won because he was fired for, he did nothing. He never mentioned God. He never mentioned creation. He just published a soft tissue find. These are Santana Formation uh, fish at our museum. They're supposed to be 92 million years old up in Canada. Did a big experiment on the Santana Formation fish. Uh, they put them in a two-hour acid bath, removed the scales, and they were shocked to discover filet underneath. Not mummified filet, like invite you to lunch tomorrow for a filet. Yeah, amazing. Bellamites. When Bellamites get scared, they uh, kind of shoot out this black inky substance. They have inside of them an ink sac. This ink sac was supposed to be in stone that was 150 million years old. Evolutionists looked at it. They said, this is like a one in a billion chance. It's a one in a billion chance. They took a pen, put it inside the ink sac, and drew a picture of the animal using its own ink. Is that ink actually, you know, 150 million years old? One in a billion chance? I think not. Little Mary Anning, she's not little in this picture. She grew up, but when she was little, she started collecting fossils. And uh, she found so many ink sacs with so much fresh ink that she started a cottage industry in Lyme Regis in England to have people draw pictures of the animals she was finding using the ink from the ink sacs. They're not one in a billion. They're all over the place. We have a couple at our museum. Fossil amber. Everything found in amber actually looks young. It does not look old. Now, fossil amber technically is plant resin. If you wanted to be loosey-goosey about the definition, you'd call it tree sap, but it's technically plant resin. Uh, when it, about 85 to 90 percent of the stuff you find in the jewelry stores are fake. They make it out of plastic. If you're looking at two perfect flies side by side in your little necklace that you're going to pay 40 bucks for, it's guaranteed fake. You have to be able to see through the wings. That's the easiest way to tell or put it under a black light or a glow blue or green and if it doesn't it's fake. But most of what's out there is fake. What is in amber all looks young. They found living bacteria, living bacteria in bee intestines in amber that's supposed to be 25 million years old. Could bacteria really live 25 million years? They found yeast in amber. And you know if you bake, yeast is alive. It produces waste. Would it not poison itself in less than 45 million years? Of course, leave it to the people from California, you know, the other coast. Now I have a son-in-law from the other coast who I love very dearly, so I can't make fun of the other coast very much anymore. But can yeast really last 45 million years? I mean, it's, it's crazy. All stuff, it all looks young. Uh, in Alberta's uh, millennial mine, there's tons of plesiosaurs and all kinds of big, huge sea creatures. And all of a sudden, they find right in the middle a giant tank called an, a notosaur, just like an ankylosaur. And this notosaur, literally, if you took a tank and put legs on it, it would be him. Uh, just huge. 
This is not a replica. This is actually him. Now, what's amazing is, is these little triangular-looking sheaths on his back, they're made out of keratin, what your fingernails are made of, and it's all there, intact, not mineralized, not mummified, not fossil, nothing, not fossil, nothing. It's just fresh stuff. So could keratin really last millions of years? Tons of mammoth stuff. I'm only going to show you one, and we'll leave this topic. Uh, this is one of the newest mammoths dug up. They look down at the leg, and oh, it's actually bleeding all over the place. Is that old? No, it's really not. Now, what about cloning? Get asked all the time about cloning. If you're young, you will see cloned animals. Absolutely. If you're a little older like me, we may not see cloned animals, but they're very close on the mammoth. And here's the key. If you can actually find DNA that's that fresh, that you can clone an animal from it, it's not old at all. And the mammoth DNA is fresh. It's not old. They're going to stick it in elephants, the same kind, and they will be able to clone backwards the traits that they want. You will see a cloned mammoth in most of your lifetime. It's, not, it's probably 10 years away. Oh, I'd love to have one of those passed um, what about dinosaurs? Well, it's not working too good with dinosaurs because they got the DNA and it looks fresh, but uh, they're sticking it in chicken and it's not happening. So anyway, it's, it's a whole nother story. Did dinosaurs interact with man? Now, remember, evolutionists say that's a ridiculous question. Why even ask that question? They're at least 63 to 65 million years apart. But whoa. If you read the Word of God, you see land animals made on day six. You see man made on day six. And you know what? This is a journey. It was a journey for me. It's a journey of understanding for you. You work your way through this issue. You need to understand it, especially if you are a parent or a grandparent. You have got to teach your children and grandchildren this topic because if you don't, they will be eaten alive by their professors, literally. So, day six, God makes man and land animals. So, let's start with the Bible. Tyndale translated the Bible into English. First one to do so, translated the New Testament and was burned at the stake for doing so. Matthews comes around, and he doesn't want to be birthed at the stake, so he used a synonym, a different name. That's not the right word. It's what happens when you hit 60 past you. See, you're a couple years away from it, but it's, it's coming, it's coming. And uh, so anyways, Matthews comes, and he's going to translate the Old Testament. So I actually have this uh, copy in the back, and you can take a look at it for yourselves. And it's the first time... The Bible is translated into English. That thing back there is 500 years old, that piece of paper back there. It's in Old English, but I'll read it for you. You can see it up on the screen. Translated into modern English. Uh, Thorns will grow in the palaces, nettles and thistles in the strongholds, that the dragons may have their pleasure therein always referred to dragons as real, understood them to be rare, but they were always called dragons. Now, I get all kids all the time ask me, why don't I see the word dinosaur in the Bible? I'm reading the, word, the Bible, and I'm not seeing the word dinosaur anywhere. Why? Because we made the word up. Let's make up a word. Haruga Hagasaki. Why don't you see the word Haruga Hagasaki in the Bible? You made it up. All right, we made the word up dinosaur 100 years ago. That's why it's not in the Bible but the word dragon is, it's the same creature. It was understood to be rare but real. This is a dinosaur. This is also in the back, also 500 years old. Uh, this dinosaur came out of a river in uh, India. It was recorded in ancient German. And you can take a look at that in the back later on. So let's go to these chateaus in France. And this is a chateau owned by the kings. This is a royal chateau. And they had an animal that represented themselves that was illustrated for each one of their reigns. Now, I kind of get this, right? 
I am the porcupine king. I picked the porcupine because if you mess with me, I will put my quills in your face. I get the porcupine king, okay? But here's a throne room. On the wall is a creature representing this gentleman's reign, his kingship, his royalty, etc. And it looks like that. Oh, and I'd look like that and go, that is a dragon slash dinosaur. And they say, no, it is not. They are not allowed to know what dinosaurs are for 400 more years. That is a salamander. Wow, that's pretty impressive. You know, you mess with me, I'm the salamander king, I will bite your toe. Well, it's the only salamander I have ever seen with a dinosaur head. It's the only salamander I've ever seen with the dermal spines that we just discovered a couple years ago that go down its back. It's an anatomically correct dinosaur. Let's come over to the throne for the queen sitting there in the middle of the picture, and we're going to kind of go over there. And why is the throne placed right there instead of next to, like, the king's throne? What is that animal that's they're hiding behind this tapestry that's 400 years old? Let's look. It's a dinosaur. It's a mom dinosaur. And it's got dermal spines on its back also, which we didn't even know what they were until like 2007. Uh, the baby off to the side, I'm going to highlight him for you. I want you to look at his back. He's got something on that back we now call Rosetta patterns. We didn't know what Rosetta patterns were to 2007. The Black Hills Institute's done so much work on this stuff. Yeah, this is again an anatomically perfect dinosaur. St. George's Chapel in Barcelona. Uh, this is an altar cloth made in the 1600s, two and a half hundred years before you're allowed to know what dinosaurs are. And Sir George is slaying a dragon. Now when you look at the dragon, you look at the teeth, the guys who really know, and the ladies that really know their dinosaurs, would say, well, that's easy to figure out what dinosaur that is. That's a nothosaurus based on the teeth, based on the body size. Very distinct, easily to recognize. Wait a second. They actually drew a picture of a perfect Nothosaurus several hundred years before you're allowed to know what they are. Absolutely. And they're always anatomically correct. Look at this coin. This is called an English angel, gold coin. Uh, a lot of the kings made this interpretation of the angel Michael destroying a dragon. What's amazing is I took the oldest one, you know, James, King James made some, the, I think the second, Elizabeth I did, Henry VIII did. Uh, this is uh, Edward IV from the 1400s. Hundreds of years, 400 years before you're allowed to know what dinosaurs are. He, uh, he showed something very particular about this dinosaur. He showed the horns on its head. He showed the dermal spines running down its back, which again, we didn't know what they were. He showed reptile scales quite clearly. He showed the leg done perfectly. In fact, his interpretation of a carnosaur couldn't be beat. Same horns, same dermal spines, same reptile scale, same legs, same tail, same everything. And that's the problem with all this stuff is it seems like we've seen these because they're not just slightly accurate, they're anatomically perfect. Carlisle Cathedral Last time that you were allowed to see what is under that carpet, the carpet is rolled over that thing on purpose. Now you could get a piece of paper at the museum store, it's not a museum, and you could take some black stuff and rub it and do what is called a brass rubbing and bring that, any image in the place, up onto that piece of paper and take it home with you. It's called a brass rubbing. They sell all of them in the museum store. So I asked if I could purchase a brass rubbing of Bishop Bell's tomb. And the curator said, absolutely not. Why? If you could do a brass rubbing, you have the brass in the whole place. Why can't you do Bishop Bell's tomb? Well, because he died hundreds of years before you're allowed to know what dinosaurs were. And he liked fish, he liked dogs, he liked birds, he liked bats, and he liked dinosaurs. In fact, he did the long necks with the head on it correctly done. We did it wrong and called it a brontosaurus. We put the right head on it finally, called it a patasaurus. They did it correctly. He did the spikes on the armored dinosaurs on their tails correctly when we got those wrong also. He loved long necks. He loved armored dinosaurs. He loved triceratops. He loved dinosaurs. So when I called up and asked, 
to, to get the brass rubbing, and she said, no. I said, why not? She said, she's typing this to me, obviously. Uh, because, I'm not going to sell one to you because you believe that those are dinosaurs and they're actually mythical animals of his imagination. And I said, man, you know, take a dinosaur book, put it down next to the tomb. You're going to discover they're not actually just accurate, accurate. They're anatomically perfect. And they're always anatomically perfect. Nope, we're not selling you. Put the carpet back down. Nobody's allowed to look anymore. Uh, Anasazi, which came before the North American Indians, drew pictures of them on the cliff walls uh, down in Peru, the Inca, the Inca, the Nazca, the Paracas. They're all living there about the same time, and they're all making stuff. And the Nazcas are making huge animals, pictures of animals on the desert floor. This is a hummingbird the length of three football fields. And it seems like the best option was they were kind of sh showing their gods that there's animals down here. Please, please, please send water. So there's 800-foot hummingbirds, and uh, there's dinosaurs. In fact, the guys who fly over them every day with the tourists, they say, yeah, those are absolutely dinosaurs. Alberto Jaquinto, the head archaeologist for the, the uh, Peruvian government, says, yeah, they're dinosaurs. Uh, Maria Reich, who studied her whole life those uh, dinosaurs, she's German, and she actually made an encyclopedia of the Nazca lines and included those in her dinosaur collection section. Palestrina mosaic clearly showing Ethiopian warriors attacking, oh, it's got to be a cow. They're not allowed to know what dinosaur is. No, 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 they're not a, it's a cow. No, it's not. It's clearly a dinosaur. It's one of the newest ones, and we're Creationists are all over the world looking at this stuff. This is Qu uh, Professor Guevara, a rock art, the president of the Rock Art Association. He's been an archaeologist for 40 years. Deep in Amazon, he finds a picture of what likes, looks like a uh, spear-throwing, atlatl-throwing people throwing at a dinosaur. He, uh, he says, yeah, you know, it looks like it is a dinosaur and people were alive with it. He brought in 10 archaeologists because he was so shook up about this because it went against everything he believed. And they all affirmed, yeah, you know, this is very ancient. And they were all stunned. And they decided to develop a method, a very cutting edge method, whereby they can date just the pigment used in the coloring, but not the minerals in the rock. And the date they gave this picture was 3,290 years ago. Not 65 million, 3,000 years ago. Could dinosaurs fit on the ark? I hear this all the time. Come on, Paul, don't be ridiculous. This Argentosaurus is the size of three school buses. There's no way this bad boy's fitting on the ark. There's no way. Let me ask you a question. Is this the one they're taking on the ark? They get bigger and bigger as they get older. They never stop growing. They don't have the caps on the ends of their bones like we do, so they grow forever. If you were growing forever, you'd be through the ceiling, right? So they're growing forever. So that's actually grandma and grandpa you're looking at, the big boys. The purpose of the animals on the ark was reproduction, to have babies. Is grandma and grandpa having the babies? No. The younger individuals are having the babies. And so how big are the younger individuals? The biggest egg we got is the size of a basketball. That's the biggest one. So they're taking the juveniles. You got 15 kinds of dinosaurs. That's it, right? Could you fit 15 times 2? Could you fit 30 animals this big on the ark to represent the dinosaurs? Easy. But what actually happens during the flood and how do the dinosaurs actually die? Well, they could fit on the ark, but most of them do die during the flood. But when they get off the ark and they start populating the earth, what is happening? The big food is gone forever. This fern right up here, which I didn't put up here. I appreciate you putting up here. It's right in the exact spot I could use it. That fern and ferns before the flood some of them were 40 feet long. Now, you're not going to find a 40-foot fern in the woods today. You're going to find a 3-foot fern. A 40-foot fern. That's what they were eating. 
if you required 1,000 pounds of vegetation a day, and you're eating 40-foot ferns, and now all of a sudden they're gone forever, go into McDonald's someday, ask them for, you know, 1,000 pounds of, of Big Macs. If they fill the inside of the store up for you, right? It's all gone. All the food's all gone. All the big stuff's all gone. It's cold for the first time. A little complex, but let's just say the fountains of the great deep rip apart. The earth is moving rapidly. Uh, the, when the fountains of the deep rip apart, it pumps warm stuff into the ocean. The ocean would have been warmer at that point than ever before or ever since. Thousands of volcanoes going off around the planet, pumping junk into the atmosphere, reflecting the good stuff from the sun. Super warm, warm, warm oceans. Super cold, cold, cold atmosphere produces super ice dumps. That's why God says, when Noah gets off the ark, now you will have the season. And so the food is gone. It's cold for the first time. They're absolutely not made to deal with cold. Not even close. That's why the mammoth, with a 300-pound food requirement per day, and the ability to deal with cold perfectly, that's why the mammoth becomes the big guy in the block and no longer great herds of dinosaurs running around, only small ones, onesies and twosies. One of the most important things that happened during the flood is kind of seen by looking at the atmosphere. Well, when you take an air bubble inside of amber, that is pre-flood air inside of there. You could take it out of the amber and analyze it. Now, they don't do that anymore because they're scared they're going to run into some kind of bacteria they can't control. And so they're not doing it anymore. But when they were doing it and not thinking very deeply about it, <laughs> uh, they were shocked at the levels of oxygen inside of those air bubbles. The oxygen inside those air bubbles is 30 to 32 percent oxygen. Our oxygen today is 19 to 20% oxygen. That's why when they put you in the hospital, they crank the oxygen levels up because your body heals better on those levels. The pre-flood earth had 30% oxygen. At 30% oxygen, you would outrun any gold medalist in the Olympics there ever was. At 30% oxygen, your body would heal perfectly. You would live longer. And that oxygen level is gone forever because the huge plants are gone forever, very complex, but they lose uh, the food, they lose the warmth, they get cold for the first time, and they lose the enormous oxygen levels. And they really become a record of death with no longer great herds. You look at the dinosaur graves and you see some pretty amazing things. Now I'm thinking, I got an idea that I want to share with you for next year, next to the tent. I think this would look really good next to the tent. When you look at this pliosaur, he is really, really big. And you've got to figure out how in the world did these guys get fossilized? Like, isn't the flood a water event? Why are they dying in a water event? So here's what we're going to do. Next year we're going to put in a huge Olympic-sized swimming pool. And uh, the pastor's going to fill that baby up every year. He's going to invite you over there for a big experiment. He's going to feed you that great barbecue like he's going to do tomorrow. You're all going to get in a swimming pool next year. He's going to put about 10,000 goldfish in there with you, a little slimy, but it's important. It's an important experiment. Then he's going to back up about 20 dump loads of dirt and dump it on your head. What's going to happen? We're all going to die, right? But there's a pretty good possibility two of the goldfish will make it. And that's exactly what happened during the flood. The crust of the earth rips apart, takes out the trilobites, takes out the huge sea creatures, and just buries them quickly. Now, when you look at those pliosaurs, if an alligator could bite at 2,500 pounds per square inch and a T-Rex can bite at 3,000 pounds per square inch, a pliosaur bites at 12,000 pounds per square inch. That's four times what a T-Rex can do. And they find one in a Siberian island, and they are amazed. Look at this, amazing. And they do another multi-million dollar release on a creature called Predator X, it's a pliosaur. And they are so, and they give an evolutionary explanation, which you would expect from an evolutionary group of people, and this is what they say. One of them died, 
sank to the bottom. They usually tack on there was deprived of oxygen and was fossilized. That's your typical evolutionary explanation. So if you found something so awesome, the length of the body was the length of this room. You find something that awesome, what do you do the next summer? You go back. So like if you got video releases, Predator X, you know, part one, magazines, Predator X, part one, books, Predator X, part one, it's in all the textbooks. When they go back, why don't you ever see Predator X part two? Because what they find doesn't fit their system. So what do they find? This is what they say. The site is densely packed with skeletons. As we speak, there's probably more than a thousand skeletons weathering out. Whoa. Now you don't have one falling down to the bottom of the ocean, deprived of oxygen. Now you have to fossilize the ocean. And that is not happening today. The flood could do that. When you look on land, this is Hanson Ranch, this is a creationist dig. Each one of those red dots represents a dig site. So there's lots of dig sites. And creationists are the first ones to actually put the bones on a GPS locator and place them where they actually are in the dig. Now, there's so many of these red dots, I'm only just going to show you a couple. All right? I think only the flood could produce this quantity, this density. They're all sorted perfectly with, uh, you know, the small bones on top, the big bones on the bottom, and the teeth all from an edge. I got a chunk of teeth that back at our place all from an edge. That's flood sorting. Only the flood could produce this 100,000 dinosaurs in three feet of mud. Only the flood, in my opinion, could only do that. Now, they're all dying in a classic dinosaur death position. How are they dying? What do they look like? They're all dying like this. They got their head like way back there. Most of them have their mouth gasping open. I was taught in my geology classes that they ended up in that position after they died. That they died and then rigor mortis set in, the muscles contracted, pulled the heads back. So they did an experiment. They took muscles and tendons and they pinned them to a board. They salted them. They radiated them. They could not get the muscles and tendons, regardless of what they did to them, they couldn't even get the muscles and tendons to pull the pins out of the board. So they determined that they were wrong. They determined the animal ended up in that position during death itself. They're gasping for air. They're throwing their head back in fear. You could see the pain in their arms in their legs, even how the toes are curled up tight in. They're fossilized all in a position of complete agony. Now, we're going to end with this. This is the Grand Canyon. And if you want to feel like you're going to die three times a day, raft the Grand Canyon. I rafted the entire Grand Canyon. I did feel like I was going to die three times a day. We ran into a wall going 50 miles an hour in a rubber raft. Very interesting. <laughs> and uh, you can hear the rapids a half a mile away. Category 5 rapids. I mean, you think 4s are bad? Category 5s for like a mile? Terrifying. We got the house rapids. You can hear it a half mile away, a mile away. You come around a corner and you see it looks like a piece of stone the size of a house fell into the river. The water goes straight up, right over, and straight down. When we went straight down, we were submerged probably 15 feet under the water. You're holding on to the ropes with your life. So, forget the raft trip. Look at the lines. When you look at those layers, uh, you will see, this is the restroom, by the way, only restroom you'll ever use where you can see every direction for two miles. And if you're really lucky, rafts go by. Yeah, it's great. So you got about a little 20, 20 feet of sand, and that's all you get. At the bottom, the lines are dead straight. In the middle, the lines are dead straight. Up towards the top, the lines are dead straight. The very top, the lines are dead straight. So 
Here's your two choices as to why the lines are dead straight. In school, you're only allowed to have one choice. Here, we're allowed to have two choices. Listen carefully, and you make the choices. The lines are dead straight. Choice number one, evolution. Millions of years of mountains and valleys and streams and weathering of every imaginable form within that layer. Then the next layer, millions of years of mountains, valleys, and streams. Then during the red wall limestone, it is an ocean for millions and millions of years. Then during the Coconino, it's a desert for millions and millions of years. Millions and millions of years of mountains, and valleys, and streams. Or option two, worldwide supernatural flood. Lays out dead straight layer, stacked on top of dead straight layer, like giant pancakes that go for hundreds of miles. Now you just look at any of those pictures anywhere in the Grand Canyon and you look and you see if you see this on every single layer or do you see this? We win at the Grand Canyon every single time because it's obvious. So what's the other issue with the canyon? The other issue is what actually carved the canyon. So I believe the flood laid down the layers. When you look at what carved the canyon, as you examine the canyon, I want to put some lines up here because uh, the, the river comes in at 2,800 feet. It exits at 1,800 feet. But in between those lines, what do you see? You see snow indicating elevation. It goes as high as 8,500 feet high. Let's look at it from the side. Now remember, it's 277 miles long. River comes in at 2,800 feet, exits at 1,800 feet, but the elevation is 8,500 feet. So here's the question. Did that river really carve that canyon for five to eight million years uphill? Could it do that? If it did that, where did it take the material to? It actually couldn't carve it uphill. The material is missing. If it actually took the material to the Gulf of Mexico, it would fill the Gulf of Mexico. It's not there. If it took the material off of the coast of California, you would literally have two or three states sticking out out there. There's millions of cubic yards of material missing. It's missing, and it's not in those places because that river did not carve that canyon. The flood took place, and the sediment was all wet, stacked a mile deep. As it began to compress, the water started to ooze up, forming massive post-flood lakes. As the lakes started to fill, they bumped up against this still, soft uplift. Eventually, too much pressure was on that uplift, and the uplift gave way, and there was a, basically a breach in the dam, and a whole bunch of water rushed through there very rapidly and blasted the material out over three or four states. Exactly what we saw when Mount St. Helens erupted. Erupted equal to 20 million tons of TNT, blew out water like you wouldn't believe, massive quantities of water, very rapid rate, and carved this canyon. If you looked at that canyon through the evolutionary glasses that I was given when I started life, <laughs> um, I would look at that canyon and say, man, that canyon's got to be hundreds of thousands of years old. It must have taken hundreds of thousands minimum to carve that canyon. Nope, that was actually uh, a couple minutes. Whole lot of water in a couple minutes. And uh, it's laying down layers that are pretty thick. I was told in my geology classes that each one of those lamina lines represented a minimum of a year. So if you're looking at that stack, you're looking at, man, man what did it take, 20, 30,000 years to make that stack? Well, no, that was looking exactly what I was shown in my geology books. That was actually done in three days. Here's the Grand Canyon lesson for me. I get my Bible, and I wanted to kind of go worship the Lord. In order to do that, I have to go very far away from humanity. And the reason is because I sing like a frog that got run over by a truck. So I cannot be singing around normal people. So I'm very far away, up one of the side canyons, which you're not supposed to do because if you actually go up there and it rains, you drown, but that's another story. I start worshiping the Lord. 
I decide to open my Bible to Genesis and I read the story of the flood again, which I had read so many times. And I started to cry. And I don't cry very often. I started to cry because I realized for the first time that I was sitting in the middle of a massive, massive graveyard. And all the creatures were crying out the same message. And the message is simply, which I don't even understand the complexity of this, but I'm just going to say it. God does not mess around when he judges sin. And the Bible says sin and violence fill the earth, and God judged sin with a flood. And you know, I thought, you know, I'm a good guy. I should be able to go to heaven. I'm a good guy. And I mean, a lot of people think they're a good guy, they should be able to go to heaven. I talk to everybody on the airplane, and I'm talking to people all the time, and yeah, I was a good guy. I thought I should be able to go to heaven. But then I started reading the Bible. I started reading about God. I started reading stuff like the Ten Commandments, honor God, honor his name, honor his image, honor his day. And I'm blowing off God like there's no tomorrow. And I'm sinning a lot. And all of a sudden I'm like, I'm not such a good guy. I don't really deserve to go to heaven. And it was my realization that I was a sinner. And when you finally come to the place where you realize you are truly a sinner, you also need to know this. God is absolutely, incredibly, so in love with you. He is your creator. He made you. He's in love with you. But that wall of sin that becomes between you and God is so huge. Here's what's incredible. God loved you so much, he said, I will take care of that huge wall of sin in your life. Jesus comes, he dies on the cross, and the worst part of the cross was not the beatings, it was not the whippings, the worst part of the cross is when God took my sin, and God took your sin, and God put it on him on the cross, and he literally takes the punishment and pays the price for our sin. That is amazing love. And God says in the Word of God, when you realize how much of a sinner you are, you need to turn to God. You need to ask Him to forgive your sins. And because of what Jesus did on the cross for you, He will forgive your sins. And your sins will be remembered no more. The Bible says your sins will be as far as the east is from the west. And I want to encourage you, if you've never asked God to forgive your sins, it is the most important thing you will ever do. Let's close our eyes. We're going to just pray for a couple seconds. Kids, too, if you could close your eyes, please. God is in love with you. But that wall of sin is coming between you and him. Have you, at whatever age you're at, have you asked God to forgive your sins? I want to just take a couple seconds of silence and I want to encourage you with our eyes shut to just reach out to God. He will prove to you how much he loves you. He will forgive your sins when you ask. Reach out to God and prayerfully in your heart ask him to forgive your sins if you have never done that. Maybe you want to take some time to thank him for what he's done for you. I just want to take a couple seconds of silence with our eyes shut to do We're going to keep our eyes shut for a couple seconds more. If you prayed and asked God to forgive your sins for the first time tonight, could you just raise your hand? I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. I just want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I thank you, God, that you are in love with us. And Lord, we come to you sinful. 
and we lay our lives down at your feet, Lord. God, as the Queen of England passed away, she had mentioned to her chaplain that she wanted you to see you come again because she wanted to lay her crown down at your feet. And Lord, our crowns, as messy, as messed up as they are, we lay down at your feet. And we thank you, Lord, for cleaning us up, standing us up, and making us acceptable in your sight. We thank you, Lord, for the eternal salvation that you give us. We thank you, God, for the eternity that lies ahead and the abundant life that can be now. We thank you for those things, Lord. In Jesus' name.